you are worshiping with us here in person or online, welcome to worship for the third Sunday of Easter. At this time, let's all take a few moments to prepare our hearts and minds for worship with the prelude. Please stand. 
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I invite you to take a few moments of silence for reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life, and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life, that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 9, 19, I'm sorry. Peter addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus 
whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And I invite the kids to come up for a few minutes with me. Hello. Hello again. Okay. How are you guys doing? Good? All right. I want to start by showing you a video, actually. Um, can you see what that is to start with? You have to all come up here. Like a domino set. Watch what happens. You see it racing around? All the dominoes. The dominoes are in different colors, different tracks, and they hit one. Whoa. There you go. It finished. It knocked all those down. So the reason I thought about the dominoes today as I was thinking about our um, scripture reading is um, in the end of the gospel reading. So in the gospel, the, Jesus is risen and, from the dead. And Jesus comes into the room and it's right before the doubting Thomas story. Well, it's similar to that actually, but that's in the gospel of John, doubting Thomas, and this is in Luke. So this is another one of those appearances like that. And just like in John, Jesus starts out by saying, peace be with you, right? That's how he greets them, tells them peace. They're really confused, right? It says in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. They're not sure exactly what to think of all of this. But Jesus, towards the end of it, tells them that all these things have happened with him and that he is risen and is with them so that repentance and forgiveness can be proclaimed to the whole world, starting with Jerusalem. So he's giving them a big job, right? That they are the ones who are to start this process of proclaiming the good news about Jesus, which has a lot to do with repenting from our sins and being forgiven to the whole world. How do you think this small group of disciples could proclaim this repentance and forgiveness to the whole world? 
right? They were the apostles, so they started out, and then more disciples, right? But in the dominoes, think about that. The one domino that started it all. How many dominoes did it knock down? Uh, well, but one, it, how, much, how many did it actually touch? One. one. It knocked down one. And that one knocked down one. And that one knocked down one. And so one at a time. Exactly. So that's how they spread the word. They told one person. And then that one person shared the good news with another and another, and another. So even though it seemed like something really tiny, they were just sharing the good news with one person. If that person then shared it with somebody else, it became a domino effect. And we have Christians all over the world. Yeah. You learned about the domino effect. Yeah, we use that language to talk about when one thing makes something else happen, makes something else happen. A chain reaction. Oh, like passing it forward with compliments. Okay. Yeah, so this is, this is something for us to think about as we go out from here, hearing Jesus tell us, you are my witnesses, that it can feel like a big job, but if we just share the good news with somebody that Jesus loves them and that they're forgiven, and then they believe it and share it with somebody else, we can be part of God's big domino set that God has set up in the world to share the good news of Jesus. All right. All right. Would you pray with me? God of grace, we give you thanks that you have shared the good news with us through people how, who have spoken that news to us. Help us to be bold and brave and courageous and loving in sharing the good news with others around us, that in your power and in your Holy Spirit, the word may spread all around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks. You can go back. Bye-bye. It's like I've never seen them. <laughs> I know. <laughs>
It's part of our basic identity as Christians that we are called to be witnesses. But I think we often live in the uncertainty of the reading from Acts and get confused about what it is we are supposed to spend our time and energy and words witnessing to. Many in our culture, Christians included, seem to think that our primary task is to witness to what other people have done wrong in harsh, unflinching language. You all know, without me telling you how toxic public discourse has become overall in our culture, and in the age of 24-7 news, social media, and cell phones with cameras, we are ready to capture any and all aspects of life. And it is too easy to witness to what other people are doing and to tear them apart for doing it. A few years ago, John Ronson wrote a book called So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which looks at people whose lives have been thoroughly destroyed by social media. These people made mistakes. They said something stupid in a tweet, or they were caught on video doing something offensive, or they lied about something. And people witnessed it and witnessed about it, sending a tidal wave of brutal public shaming over them often completely out of proportion to their crime, causing them to lose jobs, friends, reputations, health, even their safety. We are witnesses to what you did, the world said, and we're going to make sure that it is what defines you. Christians, sadly, have been notorious for witnessing to other people's flaws. You ask unchurched people why they stay away from churches, Often, one of the first things you'll hear is that Christians are judgmental. While we can couch it in the language of speaking the truth in love, the impulse often seems to be tearing down rather than building up our neighbors. But our call as Christians is not to witness against other people from a moral high ground, but rather to witness to what God has done and is doing in Jesus Christ. Our gospel reading this morning ends with Jesus saying to his disciples, you are witnesses to these things. What things is he talking about? He's talking about all the words that he spoke to them while he was still with them before the cross. About the ways that he fulfills scripture, the way what God did in Jesus makes sense of and fills full all the rest of the story that scripture tells the way it's in line with what God has always been doing all along. They are witnesses to the fact that Jesus suffered, was put to death, and was raised on the third day. They are witnesses to the fact that he was not a ghost, but the same Jesus who had lived and died, raised up in a body that was new and different, and yet marked still by his suffering. They are witnesses to the way he came among them, bringing his peace, and calming their fear. They are witnesses to the fact that all these things happen so that people from all nations can be turned in the right direction, share in God's forgiveness, and enter into salvation. These are the things that Jesus calls them to be witnesses to. They'd seen it happening, they had personal experience of its truth, and they were called upon not to keep that knowledge to themselves, but to tell others about it. And the disciples did that. They told the story. That's why the church is here today. Their witness is what led to the story in Acts, the story of the birth and growth of the church being able to be told. Again and again, the disciples said, here's what God did in Jesus. Here's what God seems to be doing now. Come be part of it. It's important to say that they didn't whitewash evil. They named sin without much hesitation, as we heard today. You can't tell the story of Jesus without talking about sin. Human sin and the power of evil were responsible for the events that led Jesus to the cross. And he went to the cross to deal with that sin once and for all. We can't enter into the joy of the resurrection without knowing our part in Good Friday. 
repentance is a necessary part of salvation. Not so that we feel sorry enough for our badness that God will be willing to be merciful. God has already been merciful in Jesus. Repenting is being turned again and again back to him, to his ways, his words, which means turning away from the ways of sin. We repent and grab hold of the forgiveness and new life offered in Jesus. In order to do that repenting, that turning, we have to be clear-eyed about what our sin is. And there are certainly times when we are called to name sin, not only in ourselves, but in others. When someone we love is hurting themselves or others through destructive or abusive behavior, when people with power or privilege use those advantages to oppress or objectify others, when the safety and well-being of our neighbors, especially those who are more vulnerable, are being threatened, then we are called to take the risk of being a witness rather than doing the easier thing and keeping our heads down and our mouths shut. But even here, our witness is not for the sake of shaming and punishing, but to bring about justice and to make a space for repentance and reconciliation in Jesus' name. Our identity as children of God is not given to us as a license to stand up and point our fingers and say, I see your sin and I will name it. We are not set free in Christ so that we can pile burdens on others. What we are called to spend our lives and creativity witnessing to is the fact that God raised Jesus, that death and sin didn't win and never will. Imagine if we, Christians all across the world, spent as much breath and time talking about what God did in Jesus and how we have witnessed the cross and resurrection in our lives and the world around us as we do on witnessing to one another about how other people have screwed up. You are witnesses to these things, Jesus told the disciples, meaning the things about Jesus. Even though we are not eyewitnesses in the same way that the disciples were, we still have witnessed, seen, experienced Jesus coming among us, bringing peace and forgiveness. We have witnessed ways in which his being alive has made a difference in our lives, in our communities. And we are called to be not just observers, but witnesses, those who make Jesus known in our words and in our lives. In a meeting I was part of once, focused on church mission and cooperative ministry, the facilitator asked how many people in the group had seen the preview for an upcoming movie, part of the Star Wars series. There were several in the group who were really into Star Wars. I was not among them. And they had seen the preview, and they were immediately animated in talking about it. And the facilitator asked them how seeing the preview had affected them. The replies were all some form of, I can't wait to see the movie now. And the leader made the connection to our Christian witness, saying that our congregations are called to be previews of the kingdom of God, where when people see us and the way we live together and in the world, it makes them excited to experience the kingdom of God more fully themselves. We also talked some about how a poorly made preview of a great movie can really do a disservice. Even though the movie might be wonderful, a bad preview will discourage many from ever giving it a chance. And we have to be alert to the ways our congregations might be ineffective previews of life in the kingdom of God. I think that's a powerful image and a helpful one for thinking about what it is we are about as Christian congregations and what we are supposed to be witnessing to. Our call is to be witnesses to what God did in Jesus and to where we see and experience Jesus stuff happening in the world. We are to witness in such a way that people get a taste of who God is and what life in the kingdom is now that Christ has lived, died, and been raised. 
When we get sucked into the world's emphasis on witnessing to sin and evil, we're missing the point of our call. The world delights in saying, we are witnesses to what you did, and we're going to make sure it is what defines you. But we have been given a different message to speak, and that is, whatever you did, God has ensured that it does not have to define you. God raised up Jesus and made new life possible for us and for you. We are witnesses to these things. Come and see. Amen. Please stand. With the whole church, we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Living God, in the midst of our Easter joy, we can still have questions and wondering. Open our hearts and our minds as we hear the scriptures so that we might follow Jesus Christ's perfect example of loving and forgiving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creating God like a master artist, you have fashioned the universe out of your love and delight, and for that we are most thankful. Heal your creation where it is in need of restoration. Help us all to be good stewards of all that you have given so that everyone might enjoy your world now and in the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all, the nations hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Hear those who call on you for guidance and strength. Answer their hopes with the peace of Christ and help all leaders in their tasks that they might lead with loving kindness and concern for all. We pray for our partners in ministry, especially Pastor Hipkiss, ELCA Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, Lower Susquehanna Synod Bishop Jim, Jim Dunlop, Bishop Jeffrey Clements and the Northern Illinois Synod, and Tanzania Bishop Edward Michali. Give them strength to lead us all in the ways of forgiveness and love, as they remind us that we're all actually on the same side and that we need to witness to the good around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, you hear the cries of those in need and you answer them in their distress. Grant to those who are in prison the kindness of others and rehabilitation, especially Patrick, Cliff, Henry, and Keith. Grant to those who are sick and suffering your compassion and presence and give them good caregivers who tend to them with no thought of gain for themselves. We pray for Foy Stambaugh, Susan Schellenberger, Brenda Groover, Allison Trump, Carl Groover, little Caleb Trump, Nancy and Jerry Fry Markle, Julie Carlos, Chris and Ron Schwartz, Ralph Stambaugh, Bob Markle, Penny Nace, Bill Kaufman, Kim Smith, Clyde Cheek, Colin Dronberg, Greg Starner, Pam Smith, Julie Burnett, and Linda Riley. Are there others for whom we pray, either out loud or silently? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving parent, you have given us such love and call us the children of God. We cannot fathom such love and mercy, and we are thankful that you continue to have patience with us as we stumble along our way. Help the world know that we are Christians by our love for and kindness to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ to be with you always. I invite you to turn to those near you and to share a sign of God's peace. Before everybody sits down, <laughs> I didn't get to you in time. We're going to stay standing for the communion liturgy. Just a reminder that we are not passing an offering plate, but we still give thanks for the gifts that you are able to offer to support the ministry of this congregation and the larger church. If you are here with us in person, there are offering plates by the entrances. And if you are worshiping with us online, we invite you to mail in or drop off your offering or to go on our website to make a gift online. Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. 
receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world for the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is Christ's table, and he is the host of this meal. So come, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been for a while. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come, Christ promises to meet us here. You may be seated.
Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a reminder that beginning May 2nd, we will be moving to a different worship schedule with an 8 o'clock outdoor service, followed by a 9.15 indoor and live stream service. We will be singing at our outdoor service, and at that time we will also begin singing one hymn at the end of our indoor service right before we leave. Also, if you are willing to serve as a worship assistant in any way, I invite you to fill out the survey, either the one in the bulletin or through the link that I sent online. We could really use some help from some new folks so that we can continue to have the help we needed for both of our um, services this week, especially as we have to set up for outdoor service. Don't worry if you haven't done it before, we will be happy to show you what to do. And now, may our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and love the risen Lord Jesus. The God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia! You may be seated and the usher will dismiss you.